So Ripley is the latest interpretation of the popular crime novel by Patricia Highsmith, this time being realised in a brilliant neo-noir TV series, and it immediately sets it up as its own thing with its black and white aesthetic and very Hitchcock inspired influence, and I just feel like the cinematography alone from Ripley is just an absolute work of art. I mean there is so much art work, first of all, in this series and just all of the camera angles, the use of statues and animals, just always watching Ripley, the way in which it just fixates on certain characters for so long and just the way in which Ripley just becomes darker and darker and even though the mystery is unravelling right in front of this character, he is always so composed and just so deadly as a result. And I think it's really clever with its identity being so bespoke because I feel like the film was just so absolutely unbelievable. Firstly with perfect casting, such a charming lead character and just the way in which that character of Talita Mr Ripley just becomes crazier as the movie progresses is actually really different to this version's Ripley. And I think it balances everything pretty well in terms of retaining all of the core beats of the storyline that you all do know and love. And I just really appreciate all of the new takes that it takes, for example, with loads of different characters. And like I said, the style and the cinematography is just so unique that it immediately is able to set itself up apart from everything else. And you can really tell that Saltburn was so inspired by the talent of Mr. Ripley because there was so much similarities between Oliver and Ripley and of course Dickie and with Felix and I feel like you can also compare it to a lot of other films as well for example Catch Me If You Can, The Pink Panther and of course the absolutely incredible also on Netflix Lupin show because both lead characters Lupin and Ripley just get away with murder quite literally and I think it's crafted really really well because it genuinely does feel like an eight hour movie as the cliffhanger at the end of every single episode just makes you want to just play the next one so I I feel like it really works as a binge model and you just spend so much time with Ripley. I just think it's really clever how everything has been created as really he is a villainous character but in a weird way you're rooting for him in certain moments but then you're also not wanting to be around this character as he's such a cold-blooded killer and I have to give my hats off to Andrew Scott as he just acts his heart out and really does make Ripley his own and I love the fact that actually it feels very theatrical like you're watching a theatrical production come to life as a number of sequences don't have any dialogue but the way in which they're able to still be so gripping and the fact that the audience is just literally in the mind and in the eyes of the lead character is just done so well. And speaking of Ripley's mind, I feel like the paintings by Caravaggi is really really clever as it really does show how twisted and dark that painter was and equally how Ripley is just so obsessed and fascinated by all of the dark art that this painter was creating and I just feel like from a painting perspective this movie is so clever because Ripley does feel like he's so much more superior than Dickie but Dickie does come across as being more superior because of the fact that he's been so privileged and gifted with so much money. So from a painting point of view alone Dickie was so much more inferior to Ripley and from a number of other different perspectives you can see that Ripley is actually stronger and smarter than Dickie and so I just feel like it's really interesting social commentary in terms of some people being privileged and having access to wealth and maybe not deserving it, whereas other people will do anything and everything to try and do social climbing to get that. So I just think it's really clever commentary in terms of, you know, the spoon that you are born with, what will this then potentially lead you down the path of doing? And of course, just be so cautious about the people that you invite into your life, because you may well think that they have your best intentions at heart, but actually it could be so much more devious and malicious. And I just thought it was actually quite clever how Caravaggi is then personified by the final few moments of this limited series in terms of him also having just kill someone, drinking wine, being a murderous cold-blooded killer and just looking up in the exact same way that Ripley is. And I just think Andrew Scott just did such good eye acting alone as like I said he always feels like he's in control but he's able to use this to his advantage and is able to make other people think that he's not in control when he actually is. So there's just so much brilliant acting. For example, the final hotel owner in Palmyro is thinking that Dickie, who's obviously being played right now by Andrew Scott, he's made to think that Dickie is being really stressed, he doesn't know how he's to be in control of everything, he wants to run away somewhere. Whereas actually, this was Tom Ripley's plan, as he knew that the inspector would speak to this guy. So let's look at the key moments from this series, and also do a bit of a comparison with the classic talented Mr. Ripley 1999 movie. So first of all, the death of Dickie. So first of all, I actually was really surprised that they killed Dickie off so early as I thought there was so much more material 
and potential to just really build up that relationship. And it's interesting how in the movie it was an act of passion and was somewhat a little bit of an accident versus in this series it was so cold-blooded, so planned out, so methodical and just so unemotional whereas actually this version of Ripley just felt like look I'm going to take your life Dicky, because you're not making the most of it, I feel like I should be entitled to it and the only thing that's getting in the way is you so I'm just going to kill you off so it was just so uncomfortable in all of those sequences and there was just so much foreshadowing even though Dicky was killed off so soon I feel like even from the first moment that Ripley saw him he just wanted to be Dicky and who was just so uncomfortable. Firstly, when he's dressing up in his clothes, when he's just acting as if he is Dickie, he had in his mind that he is going to become this guy and I feel like there was nothing to stop him. The next one is a bit of a question. So we never really know what was Dickie's actual view of Ripley. Was he attracted to him? Did he want to keep him around because he wanted to eventually get together with him? This was quite clear in the movie that, you know, Dickie wasn't really that interested in Ripley, whereas Ripley obviously was interested in him. Whereas this time, maybe it was reversed. Maybe Ripley was manipulating Dickie to actually begin to like him and he then used this to create a bit of a wedge between Dickie and Marge and then even after he had killed off Dickie he was still using this to put doubts in Marge's mind about whether or not Dickie actually really liked her or not. The death of Freddy was just so gruesome and you were literally there for every single moment and every single head thump and just the disposing of his body the fact that he then realized oh god he's still got his passport in him so he then went there to retrieve it and how actually he initially wanted it to be framed as if it was just an unfortunate circumstance that happened with robbers but then when he saw that actually like the weighted evidence is just getting too much that he then actually did frame his version of Dicky to be actually the one who was behind all of this and I think it's interesting how in the movie that version of Freddy is a little bit of a party animal and him and Jude Law's character just love to go out and just have a great time whereas this version of Freddy is just so entitled and immediately just did not like Ripley and maybe secretly Freddy did harbour some feelings towards Dickie and then when Ripley was there he kind of thought look this guy is getting in the way of my potential romance and Marge ultimately survives in both versions as he was very close to using the ashtray to kill Marge off but then when she finds the ring and actually uses this to cement Ripley's story over the fact that actually maybe Dickie did murder Freddy and then did commit suicide He's like, look, then perfect. Marge is going to corroborate this story and pretty much help him get away with it. I did think it was really nice, actually, that you can really see the mind of Ripley, that he's just constantly playing between Dickie and himself. So, for example, when he was talking to Marge, he then referred to himself in the third person, then very quickly corrected himself and then was referring to Dickie, whereas obviously with most people, he is playing the Dickie character. And another thing that isn't explained is right in the beginning, why is the Greenleaf private detective thinking that Ripley is a friend of Dickie? So I actually think, even though like I said, it was never properly revealed. Maybe he planted some seeds to make his dad think that Tom Ripley was actually a friend of Dickie's right in the beginning. Following on from that, that first moment that Ripley meets Marge and Dickie was just so cold and so awkward versus in Matt Damon's movie is more of a jovial funny sequence so it just made me think maybe they filmed that during Covid as there was nobody on that beach at all and of course the ending is very different in both projects as of course in the movie Ripley has to kill off reluctantly the person that he potentially could have a happily ever after with whereas in the series he has now got a brand new identity given to him by John Malkovich's character which is really funny because that character does play a part later on in the book series and also John Malkovich did play his own version of Tom Ripley in Ripley's Game. Andrew Scott honestly needs to win some awards for this performance as he was just so good as Ripley and I think it's really interesting how you're not really supposed to root for the villain whereas in this film you are just with the antagonist throughout and if anything you are so in the mind of this guy. For example when he's thinking about Dickie's dead body, when he's playing out certain sequences, even when he was thinking about whether or not he should kill Marge or not and what's going to happen next with all of the different inspectors and all of the foreshadowing of things that are going to loom in the future. For example, him murdering Dickie, him taking over Dickie's life and certain sequences, there's just so much agony in how you are going to see this guy trying to just get away with it all. And I just feel like because of the fact that it is a bit of a period piece, you couldn't get away with the things that this guy does nowadays 
nowadays, as of course there's video cameras everywhere, there's forensics everywhere, whereas in that time period, all there really was was letters, which they definitely did take advantage of, a few phone calls, but otherwise pretty much a lot of impersonation and a lot of people's perspectives, which is why this guy was able to get away with it all. And I just feel like, like I said, from an eye acting point of view, Andrew Scott was just so good. You could literally feel how cold blooded and emotionless this guy is. And it was just coming together in such a good way. Johnny Flynn does a good job in playing a really innocent version of Dickie. He's obviously super privileged and doesn't really know what it's like to not be privileged. He takes his wealth for granted. And I thought it was an interesting lesson that they were showing right in the beginning that actually Dickie is easily able to get conned by that woman who was pretending to be on the streets and just needs a taxi ride. As Ripley was like, look, you could see a mile off that the two of them were actually in cahoots together. And also when Ripley was working together with the mafia, in Italy and actually Dickie was like, look, I don't wanna have anything to do with them. You could really see the complete difference between Dickie and with Ripley and just how Ripley would just go to so many more lengths to try to pretty much take over Dickie's life. Just feel like Dickie just lacked so much drive and so much energy, pretty much because everything has been afforded to him. It was a little bit of a shame that they got rid of the Dickie character so early as I feel like they could have done so much more while building together with him and Ripley, but I guess the fact that they did remove him so much quicker did allow all of the trying to get away with it schemes to then take place. Dakota Fanning was really, really good also as Marge. I feel like Gwyneth Paltrow, in the same way as Matt Damon and with Jude Law, has just made her role so synonymous as Marge in the film. And I think it was really interesting how this version of Marge was immediately suspicious of Tom Ripley right from the get-go, whereas actually Gwyneth Paltrow's version did actually quite like Matt Damon's version of Tom Ripley, and then gradually, as the series was progressing, you could see all of the friction between these two characters and how pretty much they actually do hate each other and how they like to just get Dickie away from the other one and how they constantly just have so many sly digs and remarks at one another. But then weirdly, by the end of the series, you could see a little bit of a friendship between the two of them. Maybe Andrew Scott's version of Ripley was just always manipulating and using her and just didn't have any interest in a bit of a friendship at all. But I feel like Dakota Fanning's version of Marge did actually take a bit of a liking towards Ripley right at the end. Elliot Sumner's version of Freddy was super entitled, super privileged, and I just feel like he immediately just looked at Tom as below him, which I feel like you should never do, as I feel like Ripley just was immediately getting those vibes from him. I just wanted to remove him from the picture completely. I thought the landlady was a really nice friend and support to Dickie slash Ripley. And I think the inspector was absolutely iconic. I love his pen. I love his notebook. Speaking of the pen, I love how most sequences when Ripley was playing Dickie, he would take out his pen apart from that horrible motel slash hotel right at the end as he would then use the other guy's pen. But like I said, the inspector was just so good. I feel like he just added so much charisma when he was entering into the landscape in the final half of this series and just was so clever. I don't know how on earth he fell for that disguise. I feel like Lupin showed really how you're supposed to do disguises as I feel like it was just an absolute joke that Tom Ripley was able to get away with that. So you know, I really enjoyed Ripley on Netflix or what it is. I personally am not the biggest fan of period pieces or black and white films and I absolutely love the original movie, but I did appreciate this for what it was. And so for all of those reasons, I'm going to give it a solid seven out of 10. Now I'd love to hear from you. What did you think of Ripley? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below and I look forward to seeing you in my next video.